The Unshackled Waves, episode 18. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode, which is our first for 2017. The news cycle has somewhat slowed down over the holiday period, but we're continuing to produce content on the Unshackled, uh, not as often as we'd like to at this time of year, but uh, we're still going ahead. Uh, a few important news events have occurred the, the past week, which are certainly worth uh, discussing. So I'm joined once again as co-host for this week by Unshackled contributor Arthur Pigeons. Welcome back. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure, Tim. And we should uh, f- uh, just point out that you've had to uh, phone in for for the, for this episode, um, which means we won't be able to put up uh, a video version for this episode. Yes, well, you can't have everything in life. Yeah, uh, but it will still be on YouTube, but you'll just have to just look at the the Unshackled logo instead. So we'll start with our first topic for the... Well, it's sort of... There's a few, few topics within this. Um, Obama's last days in office, and uh, he seems to be uh, uh, trying to... Or, cause as much trouble as possible before uh, Trump is inaugurated as president. The major thing he did just before the end of 2016 was uh, expel uh, 35 Russian diplomats uh, from the United States uh, over this uh, intelligence report, which allegedly proved that uh, Russia hacked the election, which, of, which is, of course, a, a loaded term. And, of course, uh, Putin, knowing that uh, uh, Obama is a lame duck president, said, you know, I'm not going to respond. Uh, I, I'm not going to take the bait, which was refreshing. Yes, I think he, in fact, said... Um well, send children to Christmas party. We will celebrate anyway. And um, why wouldn't he? Uh, there are, what, 16, 15 more days to go of Obama's pre- presidency. This is kind of desperate measures. Uh, there's no proof of Russian hacking. Um, we've got WikiLeaks, which is well known to be much more accurate and trustworthy than the US government telling us that the source wasn't Russia. Um, and, you know, even if it was, what did they do to hack the election? Oh, well, they um, allegedly took information from the Democratic National Committee and um, they, they so-called hacked the election by telling people about the corruption within that. Um, I think a lot of people, myself included, say, well, even if the Russians were responsible for that, um, you know, I would just say thank you. Yeah, I mean, all the information that was published in the, the WikiLeaks was was true information. And so it sort of is is the US government saying that, oh, you know, people can't know the truth about, you know, what their politicians are really up to. It's just a, it's just a weird narrative. It certainly is. And, um, you know, it, the fact that they think that they'll get away with it is quite remarkable as well. Um, and now you've got Trump on Twitter saying, oh, they've delayed the briefing about the Russian hack of the election. Um, I wonder why they are doing that. Do they need more time to make a case? Um, you know, that's really remarkable. And it brought to mind, I wonder what sort of briefing this was. Was it a, a special sort of intelligence briefing for the president-elect? Um, if so... Why is he tweeting about it? And I got, I got kind of indignant for a while, and I thought, you know, is he tweeting about stuff that really shouldn't be spoken abroad? Because you know, a person in, in the position of power has to guard these secrets. And then I thought, well, you know, um, Hillary Clinton went out to get the votes of American people, and had left her server open for many months to be hacked by anyone who wanted to very easily. So if that's the level of um, 
secret keeping of the Democrats, why would the Republicans necessarily have to hold themselves to a higher standard than that? So they've really created a monster and Trump will be quite comfortable saying, well, you know, okay, I've, um, I might have shared some information that maybe I shouldn't, but um, let's have a look at that old Hillary creature again, should we? Um, and I really think that he is making the most of the fact that um, as far as trustworthiness with classified information goes, he can always say that he's better than uh, the, the person that he beat for uh, to the presidency. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah, that's cer certainly a good point that that I hadn't uh, I hadn't thought about. But yeah, I'm definitely for uh, as a libertarian uh, transparency in government, and uh, if Trump is going to you know, uh, if you use uh, continue to use his Twitter account to uh, ha have a much more open government, that's that's certainly a good thing. Oh, it certainly is, um, and you know, a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, we're, if we're talking about what the what Obama is um, saying, the the Russians hacked, um, you know, ha hacking the DNC emails allegedly. Um, well, you know, so what? Um, compared to what Hillary did with uh, classified information, which she, you know, then said, you know, I don't know what the C stands for. Maybe it means uh, paragraph C. Well, is there a paragraph A and a B before it? Um, no. Um, it's just ridiculous that she was so careless with um, all of that information. And so you can be transparent without leaving classified information lying around. And I'm sure, I'm very sure now, that um, Donald Trump actually calculates these risks before he takes them. And the reason why I'm so sure of that is that they seem to all work out in his favour quite nicely. Yeah, that's certainly a, a good point. We should touch on briefly that there were uh, Julian Assange in an interview with Fox News's Sean Hannity, where he he did comment on the um, oh, security or lack of uh, security on or not just Hillary Clinton's servers, but also John Podesta's email account, and said that his password was password. <laughs> I thought that was mm. hilarious. Um, but yeah, he did he did conf uh, confirm that. No, he didn't get the information from the the Russian government or a state actor. Uh, they came from political insiders. And it seems most likely to have been Seth Rich. In fact, um, twenty something year old DNC staffer who was um, found dead in Central Park at some odd hour yes. of the day. Um, and you know, it was a robbery, except nothing was taken. Um, you know. That seems to be a much more likely source, although you do wonder um, how they would ever work any of this stuff out if they're so cavalier with um, internet security. Yeah, I've, yeah, we must remember that yeah, that death did occur um, uh, a while back, and of course we're all familiar with uh, the Clinton body count, the mysterious uh, deaths of people who've turned against them. Um, so a lot of us say or are hoping that um, you know, Obama, or basically trying to uh, start a war with Russia before he before he leaves, uh, uh, even when Trump uh, Trump does take over, um, this Russian hacking uh, narrative isn't going to go away because you've got uh, Senate uh, Senate Democrats and uh, Republican and neoconservatives such as John McCain and Lindsey Graham who want to uh, hold a, a congressional inquiry into uh, into Russian hacking in the in the election and look at possible sanctions and John McCain and Lindsey Graham they've actually been touring the the Baltic states at the moment uh, talking with those governments about oh you know how we can help 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 you deal with those wicked Russians yes well um, as if they would know how to deal with the wicked Russians uh, I mean really the Baltic states um, have a very good idea of um, what needs to be done and how they can deal with them 
And um, if they want to find out what's going to happen to them, if they if accept too much American help, um, they should look at a little region called the, the Crimea. Um, and I found out the other day that, um, you know, Crimea isn't a river. There's a meme, uh, and it says Crimea River. Um, but I, I worked out that that wasn't... Um, it, there is no Crimea River. It's, um, it's just a joke. But, um, yes, I mean, what isn't a joke is um, when you get to sort of um, Western-orientated, uh, corrupt, oligarchic sort of governments in these weak Baltic and um, other states nearby to Russia and then you start um, you know waving your big stick about thinking that the Americans are going to help you um, what happens is that you get bits of your territory taken off you um, and very rapidly returned to Russian control so um, you know McCain and people like that can say whatever they like but, um, you know, it's not as simple as saying, well, America will protect us. America is a long way away. And um, I think that there would be a lot of people in the U.S. who would stop short of wanting to have a war with Russia. Um, and Obama's having a hard time starting one, uh, by the looks of it. Um, but I, I do think that it's a great show of strength that Putin has given by just saying, oh, well, you know, kick our diplomats out, you've got 15 days left, and then we start again. And Trump has been publicly supportive of that, um, just saying, well, we're just going to get on with our lives um, and not to worry too much about um, Obama. I mean, even obviously... Like Trump wants to have good relations with Russia. Uh, the 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 point that uh, I'm trying to make is that uh, Congress is is not going to make that uh, easy for him, especially if they have all these inquiries, and also they'll probably want to block his uh, cabinet pick for Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson because they consider him uh, being too pro-Russian. My God, a, a diplomat wanting good relations with a country, we can't have that. Yes, well, they're not used to having good relationships with um, many other countries, are they? So um, I think, you know, I, I think that they will, there will be a lot of establishment figures trying to stop Trump in this. Um, but Trump wrote a little book called The Art of the Deal. Um, and I think he's got it all over these people because he really understands uh, how, how to make deals um, and how to make people look silly if they don't support that. And I, my feeling is that um, he will probably say, go for it. Have an investigation into, um, you know, undue influence over the electoral process. But what you mustn't do is um, just focus on Russia. Um, you're going to have to find out what happened, if anything, um, where it came from. And I think that at that point, a lot of Democrats will start thinking, oh, my God, um, we've been bussing people into congressional districts and, um, you know, to vote, uh, you know, in areas where they are not eligible to vote. We've been muddying the waters about who's qualified to vote. Um, what if all that comes out? So I don't really think there's much for Trump to be worried about. I think it would be a silly move to try and suppress um that inquiry and I think that he would be better off letting them uh, waste their energy on, on it um, and, and then just, you know, continue being president before and after it reports um, and if it rustles the jimmies of some people throughout Washington, which I'm sure it will, um, then so be it. It's interesting that nobody uh, seems to focus on the fact that all the Middle Eastern governments, they wanted Hillary to win. Yeah, and they gave hundreds of millions of dollars um, in order to secure that result. Um, so what, what's a few papers between friends? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to look for undue influence, this is part of my point. If you're going to look for undue foreign influence, um, in the US election, you, you're going to find it. But you're not going to find it coming from Russia. 
um, and you're not going to find it intervening on the Republican side. This is my my best guess. I think what you're going to find is um, a lot of people throughout the Middle East, as you say, wanting Hillary Clinton to be president. And, um, you know, this is why I think... um, (laughs) I'm sure Trump will play a little bit hard to get in terms of, you know, getting them to fight for um, this inquiry. But I don't think that he's got anything to fear from it, and I think that a lot of other people do. Um, We might touch on briefly, uh, it's only a couple of weeks before Obama's inauguration, and there's uh, been plenty of performers and uh, uh, marching bands in America who have boycotted uh, the uh, participating in the in the ceremony. And it's it's quite interesting that uh, all, all these uh, left uh, left wing celebrities uh, they they didn't care about free association before, but now they suddenly do. Yeah, well, um, look, good on them. It seems like they've got some sort of um, freedom concert planned for Inauguration Day that they think will funnel away attention from the um, inauguration. Well, good luck. Um, And there there is a flyer on the internet um, and, you know, um, a suggested lineup of of stars who all all sound like rabid leftists to me. And um, I thought, oh, well, brilliant. Um, Go for it. Um, but you won't go for it, will you? You won't get organised and it won't happen, uh, is my feeling. And, I mean, I, I don't get boycotting an inauguration. I certainly wouldn't celebrate the inauguration of of somebody that I didn't like. Um, and so, but that wouldn't be a boycott. Um, you know, I simply don't purchase something that I don't want um, or don't need, that's not a boycott. A boycott is where, you know, I'm buying it, but um, I'm going elsewhere for it. And he is going to be everyone's president of the United States on the 21st of January, whether they celebrate or um, or so-called boycott his inauguration is really neither here nor there. Yeah. Uh, I've written an article on the on the freedom concert, uh, which is well. Uh, my point was well, you know, if they they can hold it if they want, but uh, I just thought it was amusing that do they even know what what freedom means? I mean, <laughs> consider, considering under the past eight years haven't been good for freedom under Obama. Yeah, I mean, you have to um, remember who they who they're choosing to represent um, as an alternative to Trump. And that is Hillary Bloody Clinton and that Bahamas fellow, I forget his name, dark skinned guy. Um, you know, that that sort of crowd of people who've done so much damage, um, and yet who've done so little to actually protect American jobs, um, the economy, or the safety of their citizens when they're encouraging Black Lives Matter to burn places down. I mean Hillary Clinton said about Black Lives Matter that we we couldn't hear their voices. Well, um, yeah, it was a little bit hard to hear their voices over the sound of um, the crackling of flames in various cities across the country burning down mainly black areas of town. I mean, um, and, and what what if someone says to you, Tim, I, I can't hear your voice. What do you do? Do you do you speak a bit louder? Um, and it wasn't ever about a voice anyway, because there's a voice, which is you say what you want uh, and people either take it or leave it. That's having a voice. Um, it, having a voice doesn't mean the right to burn things down if things are not going your way. Yeah, definitely. So we'll move on to our second topic uh, for this week, which is uh, Australian politics over summer. Now, most of the uh, MPs are on the, uh, are on their summer break, um, probably some uh, f- uh, overseas using a f- fair bit of their travel allowance, dare I say, going on a few study tours, as they, as they like to call them. Uh, but there have been a few uh, events that 
have occurred, which are, which are definitely worth uh, having a chat about. Uh, the first one is Turnbull's New Year's message, where he uh, told us not to, uh, not, uh, not to succumb to what, what he called the terrorist demands, and you know, we, we must continue to be a, a harmonious multicultural nation. Yes, well, um, good luck with that. And I think that if he wants a harmonious multicultural nation, um, then he's going to have to, at some stage, address the fact that there are gangs of people wandering around Sydney and Melbourne, um, people of a decidedly foreign appearance, um, making absolute turds of themselves in terms of violence, theft, uh, and other antisocial behaviour. And um, the fact is that that isn't compatible with a uh, lovely multicultural society. Um, another thing that he's going to have to do is think about whether there's any place for Australian culture within that multicultural society. Because he's just part of a greater tendency in the world towards liberal politicians saying um, that white people have to change because other people are somehow offended by their culture. Um, this strikes me as odd, um, if not bizarre. And Mr. Turnbull, he sounds like um, a throwback to some kind of 2014 thing where you say all of this stuff and none of it gets challenged and nobody feels bold enough to really call you out and say, what's in it for us, Mr. Turnbull, this multiculturalism? Um, does multiculturalism encompass going to the bank and somebody pouring petrol over me and them and setting it alight? Is that, you know, is that just simply the um, part of life in a multicultural Australia? Does it um, encompass innocent people walking down the street being attacked because if that is multiculturalism in Australia then people would be right to wonder whether or not um, they want it. Yeah I mean it's clear that uh, a new year Malcolm Turnbull just still doesn't get it I mean he he has consistently supported you know the the multicultural narrative I mean he's he had that he supported Labour's uh, motion in Parliament last year to have, you know, quote, a non-discriminatory immigration policy uh, back in the uh, f in the federal election. It was actually the week after the Orlando massacre. He had uh, that uh, ITFA dinner with uh, with Muslim, Muslim leaders, including that uh, Sheikh Shady. And so it's obvious that, you know, the the problems that you just you just mentioned before in our major, in Australia's major, major cities, Melbourne and Sydney, they're they're clearly not going to be addressed uh, under under a Turnbull prime ministership or, uh, in Victoria. Certainly not under a a socialist Daniel Andrews government. No, there's absolutely no chance of it. And what it does is um, it shows that um, there is need for an alternative in. Australian politics and um, I've been following the little bit of debate about whether Corey Bernardi should set up a Conservative Party and um, to my surprise there, there's been a bit of polling done on that subject and if there was a Conservative Party how many people would vote for it uh, and, and the, the answer um, you know in terms of a party that hasn't been formed yet and nobody really knows anything about it the answer was about 20% of respondents were saying, yes, I would vote for an Australian Conservative Party. And that just shows that that's where the vacuum is in Australian politics. There, there isn't a Conservative Party in Australia. There are Conservative politicians, um, some of whom are absolutely dreadful, like that Tony Abbott fellow. Oh, yes. um, but he, was, he wasn't the leader of a Conservative Party. Um, so this, this is what, um, I, I think that this is what is lacking and this is what people appear to want, at least 20% of them. And, uh, I think that I can foresee a huge 
challenge and change ahead in the electoral landscape because Malcolm Turnbull is not going to do anything to... Um, he's not even going to go as far as Angela Merkel did um, and say, yep, yeah, we've got a problem here um, and we need to start doing something about it. So that means that people like that get sidelined. It's the Neville Chamberlain, Winston Churchill thing all over again. Neville Chamberlain, no, I don't want to see a problem with Hitler. No, we'll appease them. No, we're not going to fight with them. Um, you know, peace in our times. And um, as soon as it became inevitable that they were going to have a war, um, they had to get rid of Neville Chamberlain because he couldn't lead it. And it, in a similar way, Malcolm Turnbull is not fit to lead uh, an Australian government facing these issues as as you will be ever more and more. And it's not just experience of people in Australia being the victims of um, attacks as they walk down their street, um, but also looking at the international experience with mass migration and starting to think about, you know, what what will happen to Australia when when our streets look like that? Do we want to even go there? Yeah. And uh, you mentioned, obviously, Tony Abbott uh, before. He uh, wrote a opinion piece for the Australian newspaper where he didn't mention Cory Bernardi by name, but, you know, decried what he called, you know, efforts to, you know, split the Conservatives, saying it was, uh, it would it would be uh, disastrous. And, of course, Cory Bernardi hit back saying, well, you're the only one who's uh, causing problems at the moment. And I definitely am, am of the view that, you know, Tony Abbott is not the conservative messiah that a lot of people uh, think he is. I mean, uh, there was a really good article by uh, Miranda Devine uh, last Sunday where where uh, the headline was Tony Abbott a messiah, more like a, a naughty boy, where she rightly pointed out that he didn't act as a uh, conservative when he was when he was prime minister, and it's much easier for for him to advocate conservative. Uh, positions now that he's just a backbencher, but it's a, it's a completely different thing to actually implement them uh, when you're Prime Minister. I mean, uh, uh, Tony Abbott, he's at the end of the day a career politician, so he's only saying these things now because you know, he does want to be Prime Minister again. Like, if he did, like, I still wouldn't have much much faith that he would uh, he he would do do all the right things and it was it was also uh, the Miranda Devine Klein was also quite funny that she even labeled him a cuckservative which was interesting awesome well she's been listening to Vox Day um so good on her maybe you should get her on the show yeah oh, well she's definitely i think uh, uh definitely on the money with this i mean other conservative uh, columnists like andrew bolt are way too forgiving of uh of uh tony abbott and you know his uh, his apparent uh epiphany now and we have to remember that uh tony abbott he sacked cory bernardi when uh when cory bernardi was a front bencher over his non-politically correct comments on on same-sex marriage Yes, um, yes, and then they can't even get a plebiscite together, um, you know. Yes, very interesting. But I think that, um, I think Tony Abbott, the one thing that he's got right is that this is the route to the Prime Ministership. There is no other. If there was some other route that he could go down where he didn't have to um, talk about this difficult stuff and he could go down that and challenge Turnbull in some other way, that's what he'd do. But um, he, although he's not trustworthy, he knows that um, the alternative that Australia is looking for is a conservative alternative. And they, he knows very well that that's um, not being given by Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he definitely is saying the right things now. But my point is that you know I just uh, I, I I just don't buy uh, buy it. I mean, he's I, I don't think he's the he's the person. I definitely think you know Cory Bernardi, who has actually you know pr pretty much you know uh, stepped out, stepped on you know a lot of grenades and you know 
sacrificed himself a lot of the time. I think he's definitely a better conservative leader. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, that those people, um, the example of Trump is a great one. You get out there, you say what you think. Um, people like it or they don't. Um, and that's the way that things should work. And we shouldn't be working towards censoring each other and, um, you know, towing some politically correct party line. Um, it's pathetic. Yeah, uh, definitely. There, another uh, news item we might mention, one of the, the good ministers in the Turnbull government is Peter, Immigration Minister Peter Dutton. He has proposed a uh, new citizenship test, which isn't just questions about cricket as it used to be, but actually is going to test people, you know, whether they're able to, you know, get, um, get jobs in Australia, uh, what skills they have, you know, commitment to Australian values. So it's going to be a much more uh, solid a solid one so uh this is another uh good good uh, a good bit of policy from peter dutton yes well hopefully um but I, I do wonder whether the problem is at that end of people obtaining citizenship or whether it's more at the end of people coming into australia in the first place so what i mean by that is okay, so people can pass a citizenship test. What happens to some um, migrant from the third world who doesn't pass the citizenship test? Nothing. They still get to keep living in Australia, I presume. So, well, you know... So it's definitely easier to deport a person who's not a citizen. I mean, we had that whole um, stripping citizenship debate uh, a while back, and if they're, if they're not a citizen, then uh, it's a lot easier if they are involved in crime or terrorism to, uh, f for them to leave. Yes, um, I, I agree, but I also think that, um, you know, the, the fact of them being in Australia, whether they're a citizen or not, um, it is a much larger problem. Uh, and that the, the door to citizenship is not the, that's not the big door that I would be closing. Um, but it's a start, yes. I noticed that um, Pauline Hanson doesn't think much of this uh, proposal. She said uh, apparently they'll they'll be given the answers anyway. So so sh she's not it. She's not impressed. But um, I do think that Dutton has a good record in immigration. And I noticed that uh, there was another article by this Fairfax columnist, Ruby Haman. She'd already, about three months ago, she called for Dutton to be sacked. And she said, oh, this year, uh, we should call for his sacking again. Like, well, they're not going to listen to you the second time, I don't think. No, well, um, you know, hopefully not. And um, let them call for his sacking all they want. Um, you know, what for? Well, well, if they're calling for his sacking, then he's obviously uh, uh, doing something right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of people in Australia and throughout the world who are yet to wake up and realise um, who these leftists are actually working for. And the fact that, they're, you know, it's, it's the same bloody words, the same stuff, from them, whether they live in Canada, Germany, um, the United Kingdom, the United States, um, New Zealand, Australia. It's all the same bullshit. You could take one speech from one of them and change a couple of names around and it would just sound like, you know, that, that person could be um, from a totally different country because they they're just an amorphous blob really so yeah i mean let them bay for his sacking um and hopefully he'll wear that as a badge of pride yeah i mean he's held firm on obviously uh you know keeping you know nauru and and manis open and he's not afraid to stand up to the to the refugee uh, advocates you've got to be um, very careful with the refugee advocates that they don't think that they're um, 
getting too much um, influence over government, really. Yeah, definitely. So we'll move on to our final topic for this week, which is more terrorism again. Uh, we could probably discuss this every week with the amount that's going on, but specifically we're going to talk about terrorism in Turkey because there was a New Year's Eve uh, terrorist attack in a uh, nightclub in Istanbul, and uh, a lot of uh, terror experts are predicting a, a year of uh, terror in Turkey. Uh, ISIS has claimed uh, responsibility, and this uh, venue was targeted because a lot of Western and uh, Christians uh, were there, uh, so it was clearly aimed at uh, uh, infidels, and they haven't caught the attack yet. So um, obviously uh, Turkish authorities, uh, f uh, given that there's still a state of emergency after the, the coup, in, coup in July, that they still couldn't uh, prevent and apprehend this person immediately, is, is quite concerning. It is concerning, and so I can't really tell you whether um, this is because nightclub attacks in America get reported and in other parts of the world don't get reported so much, but um, my feeling about it is that this attack mirrors the attack on Pulse in Orlando, and that therefore we have um, a massacre in, that's pioneered in the West. It, it, a way of killing people en masse that's pioneered in a Western country um, by a, an attacker on US soil, and then that um, type of attack is taken back home and re-imported to the Middle East. So it's not so much anymore that you're going to be subjected to some kind of attack that it mirrors something that's happened in the Middle East. It's more like um, Middle Eastern people may be uh, taken into situations that have actually been pioneered in the West. And that's a development that I really think we should be looking at very closely because that is um, incredibly disturbing, uh, to say the least, and incredibly dangerous for people throughout the West and, uh, and of course, Middle Eastern countries. But you pointed out that they've been unable to find um, the attackers. Um, and this is a bit of a common theme. Um, they're very good at tracking down people who've spoken against the government or who might have had sympathies towards... Um, Posted something and, on Facebook. Yeah, or, or you know, maybe been a little bit too high up in the army during the coup or attempted coup last year. Um, and so innocent people who shouldn't have anything to fear um, are, are terrified, and rightly so. And um, if you've done a massacre, um, they might not find you till many days later. I mean, they didn't find that guy from the Berlin um, Christmas market attack until three or four days later in Italy, for God's sake. So they're able to cross borders um, who knows where this attacker is? Um, and I think it's very emboldening for ISIS if they're actually able to send people in and sometimes get them back. Well, uh, this situation in Turkey, it's uh, its a lot more complicated than meets the eye because the, the Turkish uh, government, which is ruled by uh, basically an, an Islamist party, was initially... Uh, supportive in Syria of the, the Syrian rebels and that was actually facilitating a lot of uh, smuggling of weapons and fighters uh, from Turkey over to Syria. But now, uh, but under pressure from Russia and the fact that uh, ISIS has, has pretty much got a, got a stranglehold on the, the rebel movement, they've now done a complete 180 and are now uh, trying to help uh, Assad uh, remain in power and these uh, radical Islamist groups, which they pretty much enabled through uh, through allowing uh, free travel of people and weapons from from Turkey through to Syria, uh, that's now come back to, to bite them. And uh, this is why a lot of people are predicting a year of year of terror in Turkey. And it's also another thing interesting thing to note is that after the coup, they sacked a lot of their 
intelligence officers. So they pretty much got not a very, uh, they haven't got a, a very, a, a very strong uh, uh, intelligence apparatus at the moment, so that makes makes them even even more vulnerable. And of course, uh, the current Turkish government they're they're going to use any further attacks to cement their their stranglehold on on power as well. So it's a it's a recipe for chaos there. Absolutely. I mean, what kind of a prediction is that? A year of a year of terror. Um, who knows how many years of terror they have ahead of them. Um, what I do know quite certainly is who's to blame, and that is the current Turkish government. And these people have all been caught unawares. They thought that they knew uh, Islamism. They thought that they were Islamists themselves. They, In the case of Germany and other countries in Europe, they thought that they would be able to handle the Islamists. But the pathology is so savage that um, you know it's you, you you can't touch it you can only um, you know kill it with fire from afar really and these people have put their citizens lives at risk by inviting these people in um, and the fruits of that are being seen across the whole continent it's not just Turkey um, and, and we mustn't forget that the Europeans and um, the European Union really, really wanted to let Turkey in. Uh, they probably still do. They're probably just not saying it out loud. Yeah, and it's certainly uh, sad what's what's happened to Turkey. I mean, for many years it was an example of a uh, secular Islamic majority country. I mean, it, it used to be the the caliphate under the Ottoman Empire until 1922, when it became a a, a, se a secular. Uh, Republic, but now in recent times, especially under the current government, it's slipped back into uh, uh, is uh, Islamist uh, influence. And of course, there was the the law, law proposed not too long ago, which uh, allowed which would have allowed child rape if the rapist had married uh, their victim. That was uh, uh, th that was abandoned after massive backlash. But that just gives you an indication of of how how far back uh, Turkey slipped in recent years. Yes, and um, having been to Turkey myself many years ago, um, you can't really look at it in the same light as people who haven't been. Um, you know, the reality of people falling into the Bosphorus at this time of year, trying to escape um, gunfire, it's all too um, believable and it's horrifying because, you know, that, that water is freezing. And um, I can just imagine it um, so clearly. And it, it is so upsetting to think of that. There's also um, the fact that the airport attacks, because there have been many attacks in, in Turkey. Yes. So there was an airport attack. Once again, this airport attack, it was like the one in Belgium. So it happened after the one in Belgium. Um, and that attack was um, against the Kemal Ataturk um, airport. Now, Kemal Ataturk was the man who founded the secular state of Turkey. And so that being the, the name of the target, I couldn't help but think that that was not chosen at random um, and that there was a very good, um, you know, rationale behind that in terms of um, attacking the legacy of Ataturk himself. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely uh, very concerning, and um, considering the fact that, yeah, like you, like you said, that you know Turkey has has long been considered uh, part of Europe, and now it looks like you know becoming uh, quite a negative influence in Europe. And it's also, I mean, a lot of people talk about uh, successful uh, secular Islamic countries, but even back here, uh, there there's signs. That that uh, Indonesia, for example, is turning in a more uh, Islamist uh, direction. 
So it's it, it's happening all over. Like it's it's not just confined to the 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 Middle East anymore. This uh, radical uh, Islamic movement. It's it's spreading to other Islamic parts of the world. Yes, and you know, as you would expect, it would because it's been unopposed, hasn't it? Um, I mean, what? Where has the substantive fight back against um, ISIS been? Um, they've been hamstrung in by the West in Turkey, um, and it's quite interesting that, in fact, there is one power pushing back, and that is Russia. China very quietly is um, pushing back against Islam within its own borders, which is pretty interesting. Um, and there's just this gradual awakening, but it's not in the West so much as it is in other places. Uh, and it's it doesn't feel good not to be at the forefront or at the vanguard of this kind of stuff because I have a sneaking suspicion that... Um, you know, the Western secular values are more consistent with a humane kind of an outcome to this in the end. Not that um, Western powers have a great record of humanity in the Middle East. And of course, we have to remember that um, we wouldn't be in this situation if it weren't for George, Bu George Bush 1 and 2. Um, I mean, if Saddam Hussein even if his sons Uday and Kuse had taken over uh, Iraq, it would still be a secular dictatorship with a populace that happens to be Islamic. It wouldn't be um, this thing that it is now. If it were not for uh, particularly George Bush II, um, there wouldn't be an ISIS. So we need to start thinking about um, what the West's role in this has been um, and what it should be in future. And it's also worth adding to that as well that Obama uh, made the Middle East more unstable by helping to get rid of uh, Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, well, uh, that was also under the uh, direction of Hillary Clinton at the State Department as well. So he has just uh, made the situation worse. And yeah, that's why, you know, we're seeing or uh, countries such as, like you said, Russia and China, which don't sort of have this internationalist view, which are more concerned with just stability, and they're also not hamstrung by uh, politically correct elites at home, they actually take uh, leadership, leadership roles in the Middle East where the West seems incapable. Yes, um, and, you know, it puts us kind of um, either in in conflict with Vladimir Putin's Russia or um, kind of behind them in a way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, we say, we certainly hope that, well, Trump is, is making all the, all the, the right, uh, right noises about how he wants to handle uh, uh, geopolitics and certainly isn't uh, following the, the neoconservative uh, line, which has got us into this mess. Um, but we, we're we out of time now, so we will wrap up the show for, for today. So thank you once again, Arthur, for being a co-host uh, on, on this podcast. No worries, Tim. It was um, pleasurable as always. And just a few announcements before uh, uh, before we end. A reminder to vote for the 2016 Unshackled Awards. Uh, so there's 10 categories with 10 nominees each. So far we've uh, published the Patriot of the Year and the Regressive of the Year. We are going to... Uh, re uh, we are going to release the rest of the nominees shortly, but there is a, a link on the on the current two pages where it's got all the categories there, so you can vote uh, can vote right now. Uh, also, I will just point out that there's the support section of the website where you can either become a Patreon on Patreon, you can donate via PayPal, or you can also apply to be an uh, advertiser on the Unshackled. Uh, 
us. So that's it for today. So don't forget to uh, subscribe to the show. You can do that on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and YouTube. So thanks once again for listening and we'll see you next time.